I have to say I was really looking forward to this conversation because the other day or just two days ago, I was at a shoe shop and he offered me a cash discount if I were willing to pay in cash. And of course, I was hoping I had cash in my wallet, but who am I to, to, to joke? Like, I haven't, had, haven't had cash in my wallet for, for months and months and months. Do you think cash is dead? Now, Christina, if cash is not dead, it's dying very fast. In some parts of the world, countries like China, Sweden, India, cash is rapidly disappearing. The U.S. is still holding on to cash much more than in other countries. But the reality is that digital payments of various sorts are beginning to take uh, um, charge around the world. And there is a good reason for it. Cash at some level is convenient. It gives us advantages of anonymity. But from the point of view of consumers and businesses, digital payments are much easier. For businesses in particular, it doesn't uh, involve the hassles of handling cash. They don't have to worry about loss or theft. The same is true for consumers. So I think as we get to new technologies that make digital payments lower cost, more efficient and easy for everybody to access, that's going to be the future. And cash, I think, is not going to last that much longer. There goes all of those cash discounts that I, I look forward to. But you just talked about the payment system. So we have uh, you know, WeChat in China and PESA in, in Kenya. That's actually been around since 2007. And then finally, Venmo is picking off here, taking off here, and more people are using it. But why is the United States so far behind when it comes to digital payments? Even the tap with your card took forever to happen here. So why is that? That's right. The U.S. Um, has credit card usage that is much greater than in um, practically any other country, and the interchange fees that businesses have to pay on those cards are pretty high as well. Part of the reason is that we've gotten used to the convenience. Now, we've had digital payments for a while in many other parts of the world, especially the developing countries. People did not have access uh, to banking services. They did not have access to di digital payments. And these were areas that were ripe for technological disruption. So the fact that even in a low-income country with very low levels of literacy or even numeracy, a country like Kenya, a mobile phone-based payment system can get so much traction, speaks to the fact that in those countries there is a real demand for these services, a rising middle class that wants better access to payments and wants to do it without necessarily having access to bank accounts or credit cards. Even in the U.S., certainly you and I can use Apple Pay or Google Pay, but we have to link that in turn to a bank account or a credit card. So there are many people cut out of this payment system, and I think the entire world is now shifting to a world where everybody has easy access to low-cost digital payments. The U.S., I think, is catching up. The Federal Reserve has in place a program called FedNow, which they will start rolling out next year that will make payment systems in the U.S. more efficient. But at the moment, we are still behind much of the rest of the world. You also you just said uh, the interchange fees for credit cards is pretty high, isn't it? One of the highest in the world, the fees that we're paying. And is that because That's of their right. lobbying? In North America, the U.S. and Canada, it is much higher than anywhere else in the world, including uh, in Europe. And at one level, it's because credit card companies here have been very savvy about giving us consumers a strong incentive to use those cards. So businesses don't like them because you have to pay large fees. Uh, but you and I use a credit card. We get miles. We get points. We get cash back. Uh, and so we have an incentive to use those cards rather than other forms of digital payments. But again, competition um, is heating up very quickly. And I don't think we will see credit cards, even in the U.S., having this sort of position of privilege that they seem to right now. So this competition that we've talked about within the payment system and then as well just banking, what does that mean for the large commercial banks here in America? Does that mean that finally they won't have as much of a monopoly over the market? Now, there is a lot of disruption coming. We've heard a lot about um, decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin that was supposed to serve as mediums of payment. They're not working that well in that function, but they've become pure speculative uh, financial assets. Then you have cryptocurrencies called stable coins that get their stable value by being backed up by stores of fiat currencies like the U.S. dollar, especially U.S. Treasury securities. Those could be more efficient ways of using fiat currencies like the dollar to make both domestic and international payments. We've talked a lot about domestic payments. International payments are even more uh, prone to various pain points, which again are subject to technological disruption. And then there is the biggest disruption all, of all that is coming uh, down the pike, which is the move away from physical currency issued by central banks to digital forms of their currency. In other words, a digital dollar. 
Many countries like China, Sweden, um, uh, Brazil, Japan are already experimenting with central bank digital currencies, and that's going to happen. And that's certainly going to pose a significant challenge to private payment providers, but also to the commercial banking system. And of course, commercial banks are facing threats not only from payment providers that are digital, but also from fintech platforms that are more directly connecting savers and borrowers and undercutting some of the business of commercial banks. So at the minimum, this is going to mean that commercial banks are going to have to really become much more efficient and lower cost in order to survive in this more competitive environment. You, you mentioned that China and other countries are considering a digital currency. So if we focus on the United States and the U.S. dollar, wouldn't that make it, you know, uh, it would lower the U.S. dollar because you would no longer need this reserve currency to switch from uh, a Chinese currency to the USD, then to pounds, vice versa. It, wouldn't that be really bad news for our dollar? Certainly. One thing that um, is clear is that there is going to be a lot more competition in various forms of money. And of course, as an economist, I like the idea of competition. We're going to get competition domestically between stable coins and other forms of digital payment relative to fiat currencies, such as the US dollar issued by central bank. But I think what we'll see is a bifurcation with the medium of exchange function, that is for transactions. Those roles could be taken over by uh, digital payments, but the store of value is still going to be with the fiat currency or the US dollar. Likewise, in international finance, I think we might see um, some currencies more directly trading against each other. So China could buy Russian oil without having to use mm -hmm. an intermediate vehicle currency like the US dollar. China could also trade with many other emerging markets where those bilateral currency pairs right now are very difficult to trade in because there isn't that much market action, that much liquidity. So they have to go through the US dollar. So the dollar's role as a vehicle currency in international payments might decline. But ultimately, if you think about a reserve currency, one that investors around the world turn to for safety at times of financial turmoil, that requires a lot more. It requires not just a digital currency, but it also requires an institutional framework, an independent central bank, the rule of law, an institutionalized system of checks and balances, all of which inspire the trust of foreign investors to hold that currency. So my betting is that the dollar is going to remain supreme as a reserve currency, even if its role as an international payment currency somewhat declines. Who would manage all of this? Because I feel like the SEC probably has their hands full, given that now they're even looking at uh, emissions for companies on their 10K. So they've got a lot of work uh, ahead of them, and now they have to deal with possibly a central bank like the Fed creating its own digital currency. How do they manage that? Who is going to regulate this? No, that, in a sense, doesn't have to be regulated. After all, the Fed is a, a regulatory agency in and of itself. And I think the U.S. is... Um, appropriately thinking very hard about the costs and benefits of a central bank digital currency or CBDC. Certainly, it's going to make it much easier for all of us to have access to digital payments, but it does pose certain risks to the private payment system. It also poses risk to the commercial banking system if people start switching their money from bank deposits to central bank digital currency, digital wallets. And I don't think the Fed really wants to be uh, in that business. So the thing is, uh, question is how to design a CBDC in a way that you can get many of the benefits without many of these risks, including the potential loss of privacy. But cryptocurrencies, on the other hand, and I want to make a clear distinction here between a central bank digital currency mm -hmm. and a cryptocurrency that is issued by a private entity or just issued by a computer algorithm, which is the case of Bitcoin. Those are potentially worries. So many people view Bitcoin now as a financial asset. So it creates some potential risks in terms of market integrity, in terms of overall financial stability and also in terms of investor protection because a lot of investors are getting into these assets without fully understanding the risks that they're taking on. Stable coins have much more stable value because they are backed up by stores of fiat currencies, but they are beginning to look like unregulated money market mutual funds. So the question about how exactly one should define these products and who should regulate them, should it be the SEC or the CFTC, the Commodities and Futures Trading Commission, or some other regulatory agency. There is a lot of activity in Washington right now to try to parse those questions, mm -hmm. and it's going to have a very important implication for how the cryptocurrency space evolves.